Let me tell you what you're singing. Every high thing must come down. The high things are anything that we put above Him. So if you put a mentality of you have to do something in order to have God work on your behalf or earn something from Him, you put that above Him and that has to come down. Every high thing must come down. So we have to take the knowledge of anything that we've put above Christ and what He's done on the cross, and we've got to pull it down. And every stronghold, that's anything that holds us or binds us, it, it has to be broken. And it is already broken because as Hank prayed, we're praying from victory that this song is about He is the one that we're singing about. Where's the victor's crown? So let's sing this from a standpoint of victory this morning. And let's proclaim that every high thing must come down and every stronghold will be broken. Let's sing that part again. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victory's crown. You overcome. You overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. At the cross, the work was finished. You were buried in the ground, but the grave could not contain you. For you wear the victor's crown.
like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just are for me Yeah, he loves 
hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy Because he loves us, he first loved us, we love him, and he said that we need to love one another, so love on each other for just a few minutes, keep playing. Lee, let me help Just my You guys can go one down. Paco. Hold up a second. Wait, just how does he keep playing? Just share. You just do one song for the offertory and then have him share about three minutes. Okay? Okay. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Thankful that you made it out this morning to the Revival Worship Center. If uh, you didn't get an attendance card when you came in, you can pick one up out of the seat pocket in front of you. Fill that out for us and stick it in the offering uh, bag as it goes by. We would appreciate uh, that. Would you welcome Dr. Wright as he comes just to share just a few minutes about camp meeting and ministers fellowship. Praise God. Hey, we want to thank everybody that helped us. We had ministers come in from Cuba and and we had three ministers from Mexico, two of them are stand up. From Mexico, and Paco's up here, he's going to sing. We had him from Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> we had him from Indiana, Virginia, Florida, Texas. We fed them. We, Right Way Ministry, housed them in motels, paid for their bills. We had a great and wonderful time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought. We were meeting in this little place, which may be insignificant for the world. But yet we had ministers who literally touched the world. And we gathered in this little place. That blessed me. Amen. And, and the anointing you're feeling in the house was because all of those men and women of God were... Oh, they blessed us. This is Paco. Paco and, and Jose are like adopted sons to us. They're precious. Oh, 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 oh. Jesús es el mejor amigo. Jesús es el mejor amigo. 
amigo que yo tengo. I'm saying Jesus is the best friend I have. Hey. Yeah. He is the best friend I've got. He's the closest friend I've got in my life. Yeah. I can never stop worshiping you. I can never stop worshiping you. I can never stop shouting you are the only one. The only one, Jesus. Jesus. Él es el mejor amigo. Él es la mejor persona que yo conozco. Y así como se mueve aquí, con toda libertad está tocándote. I'm saying. In the way that is he moving here, he's touching every heart and soul. He's doing a marvelous work. Yeah. Let all the city hear His name. Let all the city hear His name. So great the things He's gonna do. So thousand people He's gonna touch in this place. How I love you, Jesus. Passion, passion, passion in your love. Passion with you. I don't want to run with somebody else's passion. I don't want to fight that I'm just try bones. I want to burn with unquenchable fire deep down inside and see it coming alive. I don't want to run with somebody else's passion. I don't want to fight that I'm just try bones. I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive Help me find my home flame Help me find my home fire I want the real thing I want your burning desire And Help me find my own flame Help me find my own fire I want the real thing I want your burning desire I don't want to run with somebody else's passion I don't want to find that I'm just dry bones I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive I don't want to run with somebody else's passion I don't want to find that I'm just dry bones I want to burn with unquenchable fire And deep down inside, see it coming alive Help me find my own flame Help me find my own fire I want the real thing I want your burning desire Do all that you need to do In my heart today Do all that you need to do In my heart today Do all that you need to do In my heart today Do all that you can do In my heart today Do all you can do In my heart today There's no better time, 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 there's no better time. Why wait for tomorrow when you can have me today? Why wait for tomorrow? If you can have this change, you can have this change, you can have this change. Yeah, why wait for tomorrow? If I can have you today, 
while I wait for tomorrow If you can have this change I don't want to run somebody else's passion I don't want to find that I'm just rivals I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive I don't want to run with somebody else's passion I don't want to find that I'm just rivals I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive Yeah, I want to burn with unquenchable fire Deep down inside, see it coming alive Thank you, Lord Thank you, Jesus Turn here I'll ask Antonio just to encourage you for about two, three minutes. Paco will to see. Un poquito. Buenos días. Good morning. Intentaré ser lo más breve posible. I will try to be as brief as possible. He's a preacher. Es difícil para los predicadores serlo. It's hard for the preachers be brief. Pero Dios nos va a ayudar. But God will help me. Ya me llevé un minuto. I already took a minute saying that. Bueno, eh, estamos muy contentos mi esposa y yo. My wife and I were very happy. Por estar con ustedes. To be with you all. Por lo que Dios está haciendo aquí. For what God is doing here. Amamos su nación. We love your nation. Han sido una inspiración para muchos ministerios en México. You have been an inspiration for many ministries in Mexico. Pero también los mexicanos. But now Mexicans also. Queremos ser una inspiración. We want to be an inspiration for you too. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Entonces, rápidamente. So very quickly. Quiero compartirle una cosa. I want to share one thing with you. De seis. Of six. Que encontré en el libro de Daniel. That I found in the book of Daniel. Capítulo 6, In chapter 6, versículo 26. Verse 26. Dice, it says, que el rey, that the king, lanzó un decreto, uh, gave a decree, que en todo lugar, that in everywhere, donde se, hasta donde llegara su reino, where his kingdom will reach, se adorara a un dios, only one god shall be praised, al, do, al dios de Daniel, the Amen. God of Daniel. Yes. Entonces, so, esto es, this is, el resultado, the result. De un hombre of one man que entendió that understood la importancia the importance de la oración of prayer y la influencia and influence de la adoración of worship sobre su nación. over his nation. Entonces, so, aquí va el asunto. This, this is the, the deal. Si usted logra entender If you manage to understand la importancia the importance de of prayer y la influencia and influence de su adoración of worshiping sobre su nación over your nation usted va a provocar you will provoke que cualquiera que reine that if anyone no matter who's in, in charge diga que solo hay un Dios he will say there's only one God al que se debe adorar Amen. the one that deserves to be praised Amen Thank you Lord. Thank you Lord. Thank you Paco Thank you Thank you Yes, yes Amen. Wow. Now you just experienced just a little bit of what the Mexican people have to uh, go through when I go and preach there. <laughs> Because there's a delay and then they have to have an interpreter uh, as well. Very good. Thank you, Sydney, for leading us this morning and the team. A few, just a few quick announcements. We need volunteers for the nursery and toddlers. Uh, we've had some folks that have gotten sick and others that have uh, not been able to uh, uh, follow through with some of the commitments due to situations and circumstances. And so we need to uh, up the ante on some of our volunteers. There's a sign-up sheet at the welcome table that, out there in the lobby. Uh, also, we need you to sign up at the Welcome Center if you would like to uh, help pro provide meals for our church family when there are surgeries or babies or deaths uh, in the family.
that we can help uh, uh, our brothers and sisters when, when they're in need of that. So if you would just sign up. That's not an everyday type of volunteering. It could be once uh, every three months, and then you might have three or four in a, in a week. So uh, we'll just need your name and phone number, and my sister-in-law, Kim Wright, is going to head that up, and she would contact you at uh, different times if you, you could prepare a meal for us. Uh, out in the lobby this morning, I put a big black barrel. There's a list of items on that black barrel that we're collecting for uh, Haiti. Uh, so if you would uh, bring those items in and stick them in that barrel, the barrel will be out there for another month. Next Sunday specifically, we're asking everyone to bring toothpaste and crayons. Okay, write that down. Toothpaste and crayons. Doesn't matter what type of toothpaste, right, Morgan? So we can just bring toothpaste and crayons next week and stick them in the barrel out there in the lobby. If you want to bring 10 tubes of toothpaste, that's fine. Just stick it all in the barrel. There's other items that you can lead, uh, read the list there and just bring them in, stick them in the barrel there uh, as you go, and you will be hearing uh, different announcements from time to time about different missions that we will be uh, supporting and then on April the 5th Easter Sunday morning we will take a resurrection power offering that every bit of that 100% of that will go to different missions uh, organizations uh, Mark would you stand please and Sharon and Jerry would you please stand these are our board members for uh, Revival Worship Center along Pastor Wright uh, is our vice president thank you guys uh, we will be praying Amen. And seeking the Lord about where that offering will go uh, in April. Ushers, if you would come, please. Men, did you get a brochure for our men's retreat? If you didn't, please get one out at the front when you leave. Uh, invite any of your friends, men of any age. Uh, we're calling up Fight Club Men's Retreat from Nehemiah. Uh, my dear friend, Don Browning, who is a powerful worship leader, Pastors of Church, Beginning Point Church in Ohio, will be leading us in worship and sharing on Friday night and then again on Saturday morning. Then on uh, October the 17th, uh, 7 p.m. Friday night, uh, Carol Marie Smith will be here for a women's ministry meeting uh, that evening here in the sanctuary for all the women. So October we're doing some things. October the 4th we're having a fundraiser, apple butter churning. We need people to come and churn apple butter. We're going to fellowship together. We'll provide chili for you, but there's some items that we need. So if you would uh, see that sign-up sheet out at the lobby as well, uh, Susan Gillenwater in the back, wave at Susan. She can help you if you need anything. We need a truck of firewood, so see her about that as well. If you were baptized last month, please see uh, Mark up here on the front row after church. He'll give you your baptismal certificate. Uh, from this past month, and our next baptism will be October 21st uh, here at Revival Worship Center. So if you need to be baptized, uh, please see me so that we can give you some instruction. Uh, my dad will be preaching next Sunday morning here at Revival Worship Center. Lisa and I are going to a conference in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia with Lynn Howes next weekend, and he'll be preaching uh, here uh, on the 28th, and then he will also be preaching the last Sunday in October uh, for us. I'll be preaching in Oklahoma uh, that weekend. So uh, I'm going out to see West Virginia play Oklahoma State. <laughs> and then I'm going to preach on Sunday morning out there. It's good to have friends and connections. We won't talk about last night's game. <laughs> Wade, would you stand and pray over the offering, please? Had that on my heart downstairs this morning. Lord, we thank you this morning for your provision and your favor. Father, we pray you'll bless these offerings for the furtherance of your kingdom, Father, and I pray that you'll help us to have wisdom and understanding. In Christ's name, amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, would you get them out? You're going to say, you're going to preach during the offering? Well, sure. We've had a lot of music this morning, and we just want to get into the Word today. I'm going to share with you briefly for just a few minutes from the Word, and then we have uh, Brother 
and Sister Kinstel here with us uh, that are going to share it at the end of the service about their work that they're doing in Latin America. This is a missions-minded church because he said go into all of the world and preach the gospel. And you know what the gospel is? Good news about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Well, how can death be good news? Because he died, I didn't have to. That's pretty good news. Would you uh, turn with me to Psalms, the 37th chapter? Psalms 37, verse 25. This is David speaking. And you know, the Bible tells us that King David is the only man in all of Scripture that had a heart like God's heart. After God, the Scripture says. His heart was after God. Despite all that he did, even in his failings, his failings, shortcomings and his blunders, he had a heart after God. That right there tells me that God does not look at the outside. He looks at a man's heart. We find that from the very beginning of David's life. From the onset of David's life. Uh, I've heard some uh, messages recently that David was an illegitimate child. I don't believe that, and I've done some research, and I can't find that scripturally. Uh, the research that I found said that David's uh, wife found out, or Jesse's wife, David's father, found out that Jesse uh, may be flirting around with a younger woman, and she tricked him, dressed up like that younger woman, and went into him and got pregnant, and then went away for a time, and then when David was born, he, she gave that baby over to that younger woman who was a servant in her house to make a, David think, or Jesse to think that David was that young woman's child. When it was really her child, born of, out of her womb. Uh, so you can't, historically and scripturally, neither one, you can't prove that Jesse... Um, Conceived David out of a, a relationship that wasn't his wife. It was. Uh, and uh, because of that, we have a pure line leading to Jesus. That was a side note. But David, when he was selected as king, Samuel the prophet prophesied and said, I'm not looking, God's not looking at the outward appearance, but he's looking at the heart. And then the Scripture goes on to tell us that David had a heart after God. What a worshiper. I've been reading Psalms in a different light because of grace, and I found out that a lot of things that David said were prophetic. Even in his worshiping to the Lord. David says here in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young. Can anybody say amen? amen. <laughs> have been, that's past tense. And now I'm old. Now we don't know how old David is here. We, the Scripture doesn't say. Um, but he feels a little bit older than he used to. I think that what he's saying is, I've had some experiences. Uh, I'm not talking as a young man who's not experienced anything. I remember one thing that my dad encouraged my sister to do when she began to sing at a very young age is not to sing anything that you have not yet experienced. You can't sing about things uh, that you haven't experienced with the same passion that you can over the things that you've experienced. It's just like preaching or counseling or encouraging someone. I can have empathy on you in different situations. But because of experiences now, I can have compassion on you. And there's a big difference between empathy and compassion. When the Scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion, it means He felt the very same thing that they were feeling. Don't ever go up to someone when they're experiencing the loss of a child and say, I know how you're feeling. Unless you've experienced the loss of a child. Because you don't know how they're feeling. You can have empathy on them. And let me give you another piece of advice. The best thing to do 
when people are experiencing loss and grieving is to say nothing. Just be there. Arms around them. Cry with them if they're crying. Give them a tissue. Get them a glass of water. But don't say anything because my... <laughs> Pet peeve. It drives me crazy for when people post on Facebook or say, well, God had more need of them than you did. Or, I don't understand God's plan and take them... Listen, if someone puts themselves in a situation where they've made choices that someone has taken their, taken their life from them, that's not God's plan. Never has been, never will be. We make decisions, and when we make decisions, sometimes it puts us in a place where we will check out a lot sooner than it was God's plan and will for us. So a lot of times, just don't say anything. I don't know why I'm on that, but anyway, that's good advice. But David said, I've had some experiences, I was young, but now I'm old. Yet, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Someone say begging. begging. Underline that word, begging. Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, speak through us. Use us today to encourage the believer to draw the lost. And Father, may we leave this place different than what we came in. For God's glory only in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever seen someone standing along the side of the road in this day and time with a sign begging? I believe we all have. I mean, I've seen YouTube videos of people that do it for a profession, they'll walk around the corner and get in a nice SUV and drive off. And they're using begging as a uh, career. Uh, but there are those that are really in our country in need. It's, it's hard to imagine that with the lavish lifestyles that we have in America, that there are still those that are down and out and looked over and left out and homeless and don't have food and don't have shelter in America. That we have beggars. We were talking this morning in the office back there. The book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, says that there is nothing new under the sun. You can read the Scriptures and find out that there always have been beggars. There were beggars in the Old Testament. When we look at the book through the books of the Old Testament, there were beggars in the New Testament. We're going to look at one of them here in just a moment. But these beggars because of certain situations and circumstances in their lives, are looking for a handout instead of a hand up. When you get in the mode of begging, you're looking for someone to meet and supply your need continually, but not getting on your feature on your own. And once you get in the mentality of begging, it's hard to break that cycle of begging. Now I'm talking in the physical right now. I'm talking in the natural mind, the carnal thinking of people under a system of begging. Almost in America we've allowed it because of welfare. So the problem with welfare, it was meant and established as a program for a hand up, helping hand up, not for a handout. But we've become, in America, we've got into the mentality of always looking for a handout and not a hand up. In Acts the third chapter, the beggar that sat by the gate, beautiful, that was called beautiful, and Peter and John came to them, he was looking for a handout. Because what was he doing? He was sitting there begging with a cup, asking alms or asking for money from everyone that went into the temple. He wanted a handout. But Peter and John came and said, we're not here to give you a handout, we're here to give you a hand up. I mean, he could have sat there the rest of his life with the mentality of wanting a handout, and never gotten a hand, helping hand up. But when the men of God showed up that had been with Jesus, had just been baptized and filled with the Spirit of God power, dunamis, 
They said, Silver, I mean, we're not here to give you a hand out. We're here to give you a hand up. And this morning, I be believed by God's grace, I'm not here to give you a hand out. I want to give you a hand up. Helping hand up. To encourage you that because of who your daddy is, you don't have to beg. I mean, uh, I've burn up with seeing people and encountering situations where people are begging God. Believers. Begging God. Even in desperate situations, we don't have to beg. Now, des desperate situations require desperate measures. I understand that. But I don't have to beg from someone that's my father. Now, I'm sure that I've encountered these two when I was young, as David said, and hadn't experienced anything and begged. Now, here's, the, here's what we get into when we're begging. And these two can probably testify about more experiences than I can even remember. He's going to stand up. <laughs> Here's what happens in begging. I'll do anything if you'll just let me go to my friend's house. I'll do anything. I'll clean my room for a month. I'll wash your car. I'll mow the grass. And he'd say, well, you're going to do that anyway. But when we carry that over from the natural mind and we carry it over into the spiritual, then we begin to barter with God and beg from God, now God, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll do this for you. And when we get into bartering situations, we're falling back under a system of works. And when we fall back under a system of works, Paul said in Galatians, that's falling from grace. Yes, Judaizers wanted you to do certain things. Now, they said, it's okay, go ahead and accept Christ. But it's going to be Christ plus this. But if you fall back under... And let me just share real briefly with you about... When we talk about law and grace, there's, there's not a whole lot of... I don't hear preachers preaching law as that you've got to get back up under the Judaism system of keeping the 613 laws of the Old Testament. You don't hear a whole lot of preachers preaching about uh, ceremonial cleansings and, and animal sacrifices and, you know, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Uh, you know, that's law. So I'm not talking about going back to that. I'm talking about when you're turning from God, you're turning back to a system of religion that puts you under rules and regulations and begins to bind you and put you in bondage because it says you have to do certain things in order to get God to respond to you a certain way. Now, there are principles or laws, lowercase l, of the Old Testament that are still applicable to our lives today. The, the principle of seed time and harvest is an unending principle. It doesn't... that you give and it shall, whatever you give, be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Finish the rest of that verse. Shall men give into your bosoms? Okay. So if I give a car in the name of Jesus, guess what I'm going to reap? A car. And your seed is always smaller than your harvest. So if I sow a Volkswagen, I'm going to get a Cadillac. Hey! We're all, we're all over the place this morning. But we've got to get out from under this mentality because we've brought it with us. See, in, in our everyday lives, at work, if you're working under commission, your performance speaks to what you bring home. At school, your level of performance speaks to what grade you will receive. On the athletic field, your performance tells you how well you're going to do. And so in every aspect of our lives, our performance dictates what we receive. We can't that's car, what the Paul calls carnal mindedness. Fleshly thinking. We have to get out from underneath of that thinking. We don't think that way spiritually. Because if we bring that over into our church, now we're thinking that my performance dictates what daddy's going to do to me. Or give to me. 
And so now we have a mentality towards our Heavenly Father who loves us, and from the very beginning of loving us, even while we were yet in sin, He gave. We didn't deserve it. It was unmerited. We're unworthy of it. But He still gave because He's a giver. My dad is a giver. My Father in Heaven is a giver. That's His nature. So even when we begin to think about things, we, t- we preach Scriptures out of context such as the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Now, but you didn't read the verse before that that talks about uh, that the law and the prophets were preached until John. Speaking of John the Baptist. And then what did John come preaching? The kingdom. And then when they started preaching the kingdom... Behold the Lamb of God, the King, and when the King shows up, there's the Kingdom. So He's not preaching law and prophets, He's preaching the Kingdom. And so now the Pharisees and the Sadducees are those that are breathing out violent threats against the Kingdom. They want the law and the prophets preached. But John's preaching the Kingdom, so the Kingdom of God is the object of the one getting the violence. And the violent that that Scripture speaks about are the Pharisees. Because they're, what they're doing there, it means they're impeding the progress. They're trying to stop the progress of the kingdom. Now what do you mean by that? I'll give it to you in looking at all of Scripture. In the book of Luke, I believe it's the 12th chapter, Jesus says, words written in red, that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So if my Father wants to give me the kingdom and He takes pleasure in giving it to me, then why do I have to violently, forcefully try to beg and take something that's been given to me as a gift? So now when we have this mentality, we feel like that we have to get on our knees and beg God for certain things. Now what happens is we beg out of a mentality because we're asking amiss. And then when we don't get it, we get a no answer. And the only no answers that you ever will get from God in prayer are those that you ask outside of His will. Because if you ask according to His will, anything in Jesus' name, He said He would give it to you. So it's always a yes answer if I ask according to His will in the name of Jesus. Timing sometimes is an issue. But it's always going to be yes if you're asking according to His will. But if you ask amiss, if you ask, like James the first chapter says, you're asking outside of His will, and because we don't get it, then we become childish. I once was young, but now I'm old. I've had some experiences. I know how God works and speaks to me. Then I don't have to get into a mentality of begging. Begging normally comes out of two things. You can write this down. A carnal-minded perspective and not knowing who your daddy really is. When you have the wrong view of who your Heavenly Father is, you'll beg. And if you, have, if you continue in carnal-minded thinking under a religious system that puts you in a mode of, I've got to do this to get that, you'll beg. And then you'll barter with God with prayers like, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll go to church for six weeks. <laughs> or if you'll, pay, if you'll bring in the finances to pay this bill, I'll, begin, get, I'll start giving back to you, Lord. I know I should be giving, but I'll start giving. But you can't barter with God. God's not a... Number one, that's not His system. That's not the way He does things. He's a giver. And when He gives, He doesn't give with the mindset of you giving something back. And He even gives that instruction to us. If you see a brother that's in need, don't lend it to him. If you have it, give it to him, not expecting to get anything in return. Turn with me to Mark, the 10th chapter. Anybody getting help, say amen. Amen. One of my dad's favorite portions of Scripture to preach on If I've heard him preach on this once, I've heard it a thousand times. No joke. Always different. Verse 46. 
Now they came to Jericho. Now, Jericho, if you're coming from Jerusalem, and Dad's on the front row, he can correct me, you're going down. You're always going down when you're coming. Jerusalem was up on a hill, a city that could not be hid. Jericho was down. So as they're coming down to Jericho, and the word Jericho, Hebrew, it means blow or wind. It also can mean widen. And the walls of Jericho before Joshua and the people of Israel they uh, blew the trumpets and praised God the, and the walls fell, uh, that said that the walls were wide enough for chariots to run around the outside of the wall. That's pretty wide. In the Greek, it means one that f forces uh, the world. And so if you take the Hebrew of air and the Greek of one who forces the world, you've got the prince of the power of the air who's trying to force his will on others. So they're going down to a place where the powers of the air were working. And because the powers of the air were working, we're going to see a beggar. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, people following Jesus, Blind Bartimaeus, stop right there. We already, first time that we ever see Bartimaeus, we know more about him because of the identification that's placed in front of his name. You know that divorced man. Oh, you know that single mom. Oh, you know that drunk. You know that addict that sits in the back. So we identify people with their problem and their predicament. And that's what the Word's doing here, showing us that blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road, and here's that word again, begging. So he's identified with his problem, and he's in a place where the force of the power of the air is prevalent. And, and Joshua cursed that city if anybody would try to rebuild it. He said, cursed is anyone that would try to rebuild this city. It's still in ruins today. And when he heard this, blind Bartimaeus, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Son of who? Son of David. Where did we start? With David, a man after God's own heart who wasn't a beggar. And he realized the identity of who Jesus was. He had heard. What he had heard was the things that Jesus had been doing. You know, you look back through, you starting in Mark, he, he heard that Jesus was in the house and that a, a, a man was carried by his friends and he got healed and he heard over in Mark the fifth chapter that uh, there was a man that was in the tombs and he had been cutting himself and, and God, or Jesus shows up and he casts the devils out of him and he's in, clothed and in his right mind and sitting at the feet of Jesus. He hears about the uh, religious ruler who comes to Jesus whose daughter dies and Jesus raises him from the dead. What has he been hearing? He's been hearing the good news about what Jesus has been doing. And when he heard the good news about what Jesus had been doing, it drew him to Jesus so that he could get something. Now he's begging. That's been his mentality. But he also has enough faith to know that if Jesus did it for those people, one encounter with Jesus for him, maybe he could possibly get something for himself. Many warned him to be quiet, told him to stop his crying out, but he turned the volume up. He had bad eyes, but he had good lungs. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then those same people that told him to shut up came back and said, now Jesus is calling you. Be of good cheer. Rise, He is calling you. Jesus is calling every one of us. He's called all of us. Yes, sir. Notice verse 50. And throwing aside His garment, 
New King James and Amplified say his beggar's clothes. That's what the New King James says. He threw aside his beggar clothes. Once Jesus called him, he threw off the mentality of begging. He realized by faith that if he could connect with Jesus, he wasn't going to have to beg anymore. He immediately, see, that identity, it was in his robe, the clothes that he was wearing. What clothes were you wearing before you encountered Jesus? We were clothed in sin. And first Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He that knew no sin, that wasn't wearing the robe of sin, took on sin so that we may become the righteous. So we get to wear what Revelation calls the robes of righteousness because of what He did. So Bartimaeus is taking off those beggar's garments and he says, I'm not going to beg anymore. And because he said, before Jesus ever did anything for him, by faith, he was releasing his faith to believe that what Jesus had done for others, he had heard what Jesus, and how does faith come? By hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And how can they hear unless they have a preacher? And how can they have a preacher unless he's sent? And Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. So we're all sent. What do we tell people? We tell them about the good news. We should be reviewing all the time what God's been doing. How God's healed this one. How God's delivered that one. How God saved this one. That's the good news. But we get around the water cooler and we give bad news. We start talking about bad news. Nobody wants to hear about it. We need good news. There's enough bad news on the television. We need to hear good news. Because why? It builds our faith up. And when our faith is built up, we'll throw off our beggar's garment and we'll quit trying to barter with God. And so, blind Bartimaeus, verse 51, Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Blind Bartimaeus said, Teacher, that I may receive. That word receive means to recover. It means he once had it. My sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. There's that word faith. He received his sight immediately. He recovered what he once had. And the problem that I think that we have, I'm not telling you that you're not on your way to heaven, but you've lost some things. And the reason that you've lost some things is you've slipped back into a mentality of begging. And when we start begging, usually, normally, what we beg for is the things that we've been asking God for, but they're outside of His will. So we've got to quit the begging. Say this today, no more begging. I'm not going to be a beggar. You don't have, I've been talking to certain individuals, reading things uh, on Facebook. I'm a Facebook cop. <laughs> About how people are begging God for certain circumstances. Because of the choices that we've made and we've put ourselves in, because of our decisions, I've been there, I'm not, I once was young, but now I'm old. I love old people. I'm only 45, I'm young. I'm 44, I'll be 45. But because we slide back into that mentality of begging, we lose our joy. We lose our peace. Because see, when you're begging, there's no peace. You don't have any peace. Because if you had peace, that God is my provider, the message that we preached last week on Philippians 4.19, then we don't have to beg. But because of decisions that we've made, that we've placed ourselves in circumstances and situations, and then we begin to barter with God and we beg God to do certain things from us, and He just shakes His head. said, my child, my child, when are you going to learn? Sometimes it takes multiple experiences and situations for us to learn. But the first thing that we have to do is get a correct perspective of who our Heavenly Father is. And when we get a correct perspective of who our Heavenly Father is, and that He loves us, and He doesn't have a big stick that He wants to smack us upside of the head every time that we make a mistake, He's not mad at you. Study sometime the difference between discipline 
and punishment. Okay? There's a distance. God chastens or disciplines those that He loves. He's not into, you know, people say all the time, well, I didn't do this, so God gave me cancer. God's not punishing you. He put all that punishment on the cross because it says He poured out all His wrath on Christ on the cross. Now, He disciplines us. And what He does there, He's a shepherd, and there's a shepherd's hook that He has, and discipline is, if we get out of line, He'll take the shepherd's hook, and He'll yank us back into line. Because He loves us. But He doesn't take the rod. See, David's mentality under Old Covenant, because he hadn't experienced the finished work of the cross, he said, thy rod and thy staff. The rod was for punishment. The staff with the shepherd's crook on the end of it was for discipline, to pull us back in line. And God loves us and He disciplines us. He pulls us back. See, when we begin to have that correct perspective of who He is, it will stop the begging mentality. Sydney, would you come and begin to play, please? We still ask. We still ask. We always ask because He said if you ask anything in My name, I'll give it to you. But we, we have to take James the first chapter and bring that right together with us. You have not because you ask not, but sometimes you ask amiss, and that word amiss means outside of God's will. I mean, if you're praying and asking God for a, a mansion that's $500,000, and you can't afford the $200,000 home that you're living in, and you keep begging God, and you keep, you, He's not going to give it to you because you can't afford it. He knows what's best for us. We, we get in, most of the time though, begging doesn't have to do with the things that we're wanting more material things. Begging normally, in my experience, has come from when we put ourselves in certain circumstances and we've got to have something right now and we begin to beg for it. It's God's will for you to be blessed. It's God's will for you to walk in peace and prosperity and joy. Peace. That's the kingdom of God in the Holy Ghost. Those, are, those things are His will. So we don't have to beg Him for those things. And there is a difference. Please understand, there is a difference between being desperate and begging. Okay, Don't let your desperation pull you into that mentality of begging. But you can be desperate. I mean, my, my Lord, I remember six years ago, uh, next week, that uh, I was given some news that instantly on the spot made me pretty desperate. And for the next 45 days, lost 55 pounds. I know I need to do that again, but I don't want to go through that to have to have those results. But when you go through those things that you didn't put yourself in those circumstances and situations, but because of other people's decisions, sometimes you get in a desperate place. And we become emotional about those desperate places. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about because of our own decisions and our mentality of a system of religion that we beg God for things that He's already provided for us in Christ Jesus. And we need to change our perspective and asking. You've got to know the Word to know His will, and then that lets you know how to pray. And we pray without ceasing. We don't stop in there. everywhere we're at during the day. It doesn't mean getting down on your knees. And I mean, Dad tells a story one time a car comes around the corner on a wrecker and breaks through, free from the wrecker and is headed right toward him. Well, they didn't have time to kneel down and say, let's uh, all bow our head and close our eyes and let's look to Jesus right now. No, they said, Jesus! That was their prayer. But that's being constant and in prayer where we're at. You know, when you... You're at the grocery store and you come, Lord, you know, where am I supposed to go today? Who am I supposed to come and talk? Con constantly talking with the Lord. That's our prayer mentality. Would you stand with me, please? I believe that this morning uh, for the altar call is that some of us need to come and just change our mentality. And if you look at that, that word is repent. We need to repent of our stinking thinking and our wrong perspective of God and change our perspective this morning.
And some of you need to come outside of the mentality of begging today and ask God. I know it's your will, Father. I just heard it preached. And these, these are the things that I need right now. And He'll give it to you in His timing. Because His timing's best. He's never late. But don't come and beg. Just, Father, ask. You know. And then tomorrow, ask again. And then Tuesday, knock again. Keep asking because you're asking inside of His will for your life, not outside of His will. Father, I thank You for the Word today. May it encourage and help. I pray that You would, uh, Lord, begin to continue to work with us in our hearts and our minds, that we would change our thinking, that we would begin to move towards a correct perspective of who You are. When we know who You are, and we find ourselves in Christ, then we find our true identity. And that's what the devil's trying to rob us of, is who we are in Christ. So I pray that you would uh, touch the hearts of people as, right now as we would begin to have this uh, altar service, that you would help us to repent of our stinking thinking, that we would come outside, no more begging. Once blind Bartimaeus encountered you, Jesus, he didn't beg you for his healing. You asked him, what do you want me to do? And he asked, and you did it. So may we get in that mindset today. In Jesus' name, amen. Sydney sings, just come talk to the Lord this morning. Steve to come up here. I want to pray for you. If any of you in this house have ever had the Lord help your marriage, would you come up and lay hands on this young couple? If the Lord's ever helped you in your situation you went through, this young couple needs your prayers today. Praise God. Would you just stretch your hand toward Heather and Steve. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you can still work miracles. And I'm praying for, for their home. I'm praying for their callings. Lord, you have called this couple. And I pray, Father, you would help them. Lord, as, as they learn to love each other more and more, I pray you'd bless their marriage. I pray you'd give, I pray, Father, you'd open up the job, the job that Steve needs. I pray, Father, that you would lead them and guide them and direct them. Get them right smack dab in the middle of your wheel. Father, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. We join together, Lord. You've helped others and you'll help them. 
you blessed others and you'll bless them. I'm praying, Father, that today you just pour out the... You didn't bring them here by accident. Lord, they, this, they're on a kingdom assignment today. And Lord, we're believing that you're going to work all things for their good. And we believe it, we claim it in the name of Jesus. Can I get a witness in the house? Amen and amen. Would you all just love on them a little bit there? Give them some love. may be seated for a moment. Thank you all. Thank you, Sydney. Because of having pastor's conference this week and having a lot of different uh, folks in, uh, we asked Brother Ken to uh, come and share just a few moments on his ministry and what they are doing. Uh, and we, again, these are one of the ones that we'll be trying to support with our offering coming in April. So it's good for us to make contact that you can put a face with those that when you give your money in that offering, you know who uh, Babu has just been here, Paco's here, Joshua is here uh, from Mano de Ayuda in Mexico, Dr. Cook's sons, uh, continuing in the ministry. We will be praying over all of these and, and asking God to, to lead us, and Brother Ken and his wife are, are here this morning, and they have a table in the back, and he'll share more with you about that. I don't know if that's going to work. Did you put that little adapter in the... Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Jamie. And I just want you to know you are young. <laughs> and good morning to each and every one of you here at Revival Worship Center. We're just thankful for what God is doing in this place. And uh, let's see if this thing's going to work here. Okay, it's... We don't seem to be advancing. We're responding, but not advancing. It's really important to get in focus. Maybe God's trying to tell us something right now. <laughs> okay, I may have to help have you help me at that end to advance this if it's not going to respond. I don't know what's going on here. Can you advance it there? There we are. Okay. Well, I'm Ken Kinsel, and this is my wife, Glennis. If you'll just stand for a minute, honey. We... We live in Mission, Texas, which is about 10 miles north of the border with Mexico. And some of the things you've been hearing about in the news are happening right by our house. We're back to focus. Come on, folks, let's focus. <laughs> I'm going to have to have you move it ahead here. We'll just let you do it there. Glennis and I are mission mobilizers. And a mobilizer is someone that trains and activates and helps prepare people that God has called to take the gospel to the nations. But of equal importance, we also teach and encourage and inform and awaken those that the Holy Spirit has called to send the ones that he has called to go. Everyone in this room is called by the Lord and fits into one of those categories. Either you're called to go or to send, or perhaps a combination of both. Glenn and I are directors, if we could go ahead, of a ministry called Kingsway Center for World Mission. And we also, click it one more time if you would, are partnering with a ministry called Perspectives Global. And one of our main jobs is to help coordinate the development of the new Spanish Perspectives on the World Christian Movement course throughout the Spanish-speaking world. And Perspectives is an effective mobilization tool that God's using here in the United States and in many other countries of the world to uh, activate believers, to get them involved in the task of completing the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission has been in place for centuries now, and Christians have been working to complete it, but it's going to be finished one of these days. And I think it might be pretty soon. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world to all the nations, and then 
the end will come. Now, I want you to think just for a moment. Has the gospel actually been proclaimed to all the nations yet? And um, let's advance one more. And I, I just think it's important to realize that when the Bible says nations, it's not talking about countries. It's talking about people groups. It's talking about ethnic groups. And I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, if I can just give you a little signal there, how many people groups there are in the world. And uh, there's a ministry called the Joshua Project that has actually cataloged and identified all the people groups in the world. And there are 9,757 different people groups. And out of that large number of people groups, there are still 4,083 people groups that are still unreached or underreached. In some cases, there may be as much as 2% believers, but there are people groups in the world with millions of people that there is not one known believer among them. That's almost 42% of the world's population. 2.91 billion people are still waiting to hear the gospel. Wow. Let's go ahead. You know, we have heard in this country, there's people that I know haven't heard, but they could hear. We have the gospel here, but... There's many others that are still waiting to hear for the very, very first time. Does that fact put any responsibility on us as believers today? What do you think? There's still people waiting to hear the gospel for the first time. I believe it puts a lot of responsibility on us. The Great Commission is for every believer. Let's go ahead. The Bible says that some of us are called to go. But it also says that we're called to sin. And as I said before, we all fit in one of those categories. Where's the gospel been proclaimed so far? If someone were to ask you what parts of the world have the gospel and what parts don't have the gospel, what would you say? Now, there's a map on the board here that has green and yellow and red on it. The green areas are where the gospel is prevalent, where it has, where it's available. The yellow parts are where the uh, gospel is developing, or maybe it's just traditional Christianity in some form, but the red areas are the parts of the world where most of the unreached people groups are living. Notice that's the part of the world that most of the trouble's coming from today. It's because there's no gospel. We haven't always had the gospel in our culture. Someone had to take it to our ancestors years ago. Now, we're going to just go kind of quickly through this. The map's going to be there, but there's going to be some facts I want you to know about. 10% of all the missionaries in the world work in those red, yellow, and green areas. I'm, I'm sorry. 90% work in the green and yellow areas. Only 10% of the mission force currently is working in the red areas. Now just think about that for a minute. All the missionaries in the world, only 10% of them are working in the areas that are red. And another thing that I would like all of us as American Christians to be aware of is that of all the money that we give to in our churches, all the money that's part of Christians in the United States, 5% of it goes to the green and yellow parts of the world. Next slide. One half of 1% goes to the red. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have ministries at home. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have ministries at the green and the yellow areas. But there's something wrong with this picture. We, most people don't even know this. In fact, 70% of all Americans don't even know there's still unreached people in the world. And that means, of course, that we spend 95% of all of our money on ourselves here at home. So we need to do some adjusting, and uh, God's going to help us. That red area has a name. It's called the 1040 window. And the 1040 window, on the next click, tells us that two-thirds of the world's population live in that 1040 window two-thirds of the population, and 86% of all the unreached people groups in the world are in the 1040 window. Now, this has been kind of negative news so far, but it's the truth, and we need to know about it. But there's some very positive things that God's doing. This is a chart from the Perspectives course that tells us back in the year AD 100, there were 360 believers, unbelievers for every believer. Okay, this is a ratio. One believer, 360 non-believers. As you go through the centuries, you see that ratio is decreasing. 
And we get down to nowadays, even though the world population is much greater than it was in the first century, for every believer in the world, there are only seven unbelievers. So God is making progress. And I just want to say at this point, God is the missionary. He's the one that is fulfilling the Great Commission. This has been his heart from day one. The first mission trip was in the Garden of Eden when God came out and said, Adam, where are you? And that's been God's heart ever since. There's another very encouraging thing. We said there's 4,083 unreached people groups. Well, there's over 2 million churches in the world now that are Great Commission churches, churches that preach the gospel. That means there's actually nearly 500 churches per unreached group. You see, the resources are here. God just needs to get our act together. Now look at these facts. Every 24 hours, there's 32,000 new believers in Africa, 25,000 new believers in Asia, in Latin America, at least 17,000 new believers. It may be double there. We don't know for sure. And specifically focusing on Latin America, in 1900, there were 50,000 known believers. In 1980, it had jumped to 20 million, and today it's over 100 million. I'm telling you, the Lord is bringing the harvest in, and we don't know it so much here in our country, but there's multitudes coming to Christ. In just the last 10 years, the number of followers of Jesus, these are new followers of Jesus worldwide, has increased by 300 million. That's since 2004. But here's the thing that's really amazing. Only about 10 million of these are from the traditionally Christian parts of the world. That means the other 90 7%, 290 million are from parts of the world that are traditionally not Christian. Asia, Africa, the Middle East. All we hear in the news are bad things about the Middle East. I want to tell you, last night in the Middle East, Jesus appeared to thousands of people and said, I am Esau, I am the one you're looking for. This is happening all over that part of the world. God is breaking the Middle East wide open. And as the church grows, it explodes. I think I have to say explodes, not just grows. We're also seeing a new emerging movement, mission movement, that's coming from places like Korea, 30,000 more missionaries from Korea in the next decade. China is expecting 100,000 missionaries to go out. Philippines, 200,000 Christian guest workers. Africa, Latin America, 30,000 more. Right now, there's 19,000 Latinos on the mission field. Praise God. But in the next 10 to 15 years, there's going to be at least 30,000 more. Can we advance here? Thank you. Now, okay, we said that some are called to go and some are called to sin. If God raises up a new force, like in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, that is called to go, he also has to raise up a new force to send. Because if you don't have senders, the goers can't go. One of the greatest tools that we are aware of in the world today that God is using in many places to prepare people not only for going, but for sending. These are the people that stay home. These are us here in this room is the Perspectives course on the World Christian Movement. It briefly, I'll just tell you, it's a 15-week college level course. It's one class a week for three hours. We have uh, it's taught by 15 different instructors, pastors. Sometimes they're local, sometimes they come from a distance. And it's a course about God's purposes, what God's doing, God's heart, and how you and I as Christians fit into it. There's more than 200 located in, in the United States, and we're working right now to see perspectives come here into this valley probably next year. So I hope some of you, I hope all of you will take it. But uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Check out perspectives.org. Let's skip this slide, please. Go ahead. Skip this one. So what my wife and I are doing now is helping to develop the Perspectives course among Spanish-speaking people. Just a couple days ago, we talked with Paco and Cindy. They have a ministry there in Campeche, Mexico, where they're training young people. You see, these are some of the people we're talking about, of the thousands and thousands of young, well-educated, sharp Latinos that God is raising up all over the Spanish-speaking world. Here's a few shots uh, of classes we're having in Mexico already. We started in that country last year. There's a course in Lima, Peru. Part of our team. Let's just go quickly through these. Costa Rica, we have three classes now. 
There's hundreds of people that have already taken this course. Before it's finished, it's going to be in all 20 Spanish-speaking countries and in the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world, which is called the United States. Spanish, 40,000 Spanish congregations in the U.S. now. On September 28th, which is exactly one week from today, Glennis and I are traveling to Havana, Cuba, and we'll be in, on that island for 19 days. We're going to have an intensive 15-week course in 12 days. It will be intensive. So whether you're called to go or send, find out what God wants you to do. You may be some of the people that God wants to help send us. You may be some of the people that God wants you to help send Paco and Cindy. But you find out where God wants you because he wants you to get involved. Follow us on Facebook. And if you uh, tweet, we have a Twitter account at Kinsel's. You can keep up with us where we're traveling around everywhere except we're in Cuba. You won't hear from us on Twitter in Cuba. If you'd like to find out more about our work, I'll be at the table and back. And uh, we have a prayer card like you see here. We'd like to give you one and help you get hooked up. We invite you to be part of our team. Lord bless you. Thank you so much. Would you stand, please? Brother and Sister Kensel, if you'll just go on back to the table. Thank you for being patient with us today. We don't normally do this, and we're just thankful that you uh, st stuck around. Uh, we love you. God bless you. May you have a wonderful week as you go. And uh, we do have back to our normal schedule of uh, Bible college this week on Tuesday and Thursday. We love you. Greet one another in Jesus' name. Paco is preaching tonight at Lighthouse Worship Center in Sissonville at 6 o'clock tonight, if you'd like to go. Bless you.